feel free to clap along. Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. And we're going to go into Our God Sings. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grave. In the name of the Son, 
saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that yes, the world will see Welcome to worship. You may be seated. Our God saves indeed. That's some wonderful words to hear this evening and every day. A couple of announcements I'd like to highlight on your announcement sheet. Uh, do take note that we are currently looking for some, some members to be on the council for the upcoming year. We've got four seats open, so if, if you're interested in that, Please let uh, either one of either Pastor Rod or myself know, or, or let the office know, or somebody on council. And we'd love to have you. There, we're still looking for a, a director of children's education. So again, you know, keep keep your eyes open and your ears to the ground, and, and we'll find somebody. They're out there, so we'll keep on looking. Um, next week, just a reminder: it is the start of the month again, which means. Our service will still start at 6, and everybody, Promised Land, Middle School, everybody will be gathering at 6 o'clock for worship next week. And, but remember, we will meet as Promised Land and Middle School at 5.30 to, to a little bit before 6. We'll have some activities that we'll be doing at that time. And then we'll get back into that normal, normal schedule of uh, in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, and, and so on. So that's just a reminder that next week we'll be back to that first Wednesday of the month schedule. Those are all the announcements I have for you this evening. As always, you can find an announcement sheet on your way out if you would like more information or have other questions. And with that, let's prepare our hearts with a word of prayer. Loving God, who shows us that true and perfect love is expressed through service, move in us the will to love and serve others, even in the difficult places in our lives. When we feel alone, may we know your constant love. Open our eyes to see the need of those around us and to show your love to all in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. 
So we're continuing our way through the, the narrative lectionary. That's what we're doing on Wednesday nights. We're kind of jumping ahead quite a bit from where we last left the people of Israel. But the first thing I want you to consider tonight, and yes, we will get to the, the readings for tonight. They're just going to be kind of in the middle here because it's a long story. <laughs> it is a long story. But what I want you to think about is heroes. Anybody have a hero growing up? You know, sports hero, movie hero, action hero, comic hero, you name it. Maybe it was your parents. I don't know. I bet most of us have had some sort of a hero growing up. Somebody that we thought, yeah, they are really cool. I want to be just like them growing up. Well, we, there are plenty of heroes. And believe me, with those heroes sometimes comes blinders. We like to see that they are perfect. They're perfect role models. They're exactly who we want to be following. And they're awesome people. Not only do we like our heroes, we love a good underdog, don't we? I mean, who doesn't like a good underdog story like, like Rudy or, or, we'll say, Star Wars or anything else that has a good underdog? You know, you're rooting for the underdog, and when they triumph, you're like, yes, this is great. This is the best thing I've ever seen. I want to be just like that underdog. And they usually get to the top, and they become famous for one reason or another. But we love our heroes. We love our underdogs. They cannot do any wrong. Well, today we're going to hear about somebody that is both of these. Is a hero. Definitely a hero. People talk about him even today and over and over and over again. He didn't quite go away. And also an underdog. And I'm going to give you the underdog story first on why this guy is an underdog that we're talking about. So the hero and the underdog we're talking about tonight is David. I bet most of you know that name, David, from Scripture, from Sunday school or something. You probably know who he is. Well, there's this war with the Philistines. Remember, they're going on, they're kind of fighting, and this is where the underdog David comes in. Because on the one side, you've got the big, giant Goliath, big, strong. Nothing's going to knock him over. Nobody wants a thing to do with Goliath. He is just this big, bulking person. We don't want to fight him. The people of Israel, I ain't going to fight him. They're not ready to fight him. Here comes David. David's not the biggest. David's not necessarily the strongest. He's definitely smaller than Goliath. So this is where you get, of course, you know, anytime there's a big, unended, uneven battle of some sort, you get the, it's the David and Goliath going on, because that's what's going on. And David, what's he do? This little guy takes that rock, slings it, knocks down Goliath dead. The underdog has won the victory at this point with God's help of course but he's won the people have won Goliath has fallen not only that you know he's pretty famous he's getting a hero image and all of a sudden Saul's starting to figure out I don't know this guy is kind of dangerous he's he's going to be the next king we cannot let this happen I need to stay in power and he's trying to chase, chase down David and people are protecting him and eventually Saul dies and David becomes king and David David is described as a man after God's own heart. Pretty cool. He's a pretty cool guy. We wouldn't want to not be around him. He's promised to make his name great. There's going to be a place of Israel. He's going to plant the people. He's going to establish the house of David and the throne forever. This is sounding better and better. This guy is great. Why wouldn't you want to follow him? Why wouldn't you consider him a hero? Who doesn't love a good underdog becoming from the bottom all the way to the top. Here we are, the hero, the legend, the underdog. And they talk about him forever, the great king, the one that nobody can really compare to. The city of David, as we hear about when Jesus is born, being descendants of David. It's all a big deal to be in the presence of David somehow. And he is remembered for all the awesome things, right? In, in Sunday school, when you hear David, you probably think of David and Goliath. Oh, this guy's great. And he's the best there could be. We focus on it over and over. But our heroes, whether they're David or somebody else, a, maybe it's a, a politician or an athlete or perhaps an actor or your own parents or your friends, whoever you look up to as a big hero, they all have this in common. They're broken. They have dark parts of their life. And they're not perfect, as perfect as we see with the blinders when it comes to heroes. David is also far from perfect. And I want you to listen to this entire story. I had to add more to it because, man, the narrative lectionary cut out some parts of this that are kind of necessary just to hear who David is and what exactly is happening in his life. 
So this is the extended part of this story of David. Who, if you recall the Ten Commandments, remember if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about the Ten Commandments. Let me just give you a quick teaser on how many we're going to break within the next couple of minutes. One, two, three, four, five, possibly six, all within one story here, one part of the scripture. There's going to be some coveting, some adultery, some false witness, some stealing, some killing, probably even a little uh, putting somebody above God, breaking the first commandment, probably putting himself above God for a little bit. So it's going to be, he's going to do some crazy things. He's going to try to cover it up. Has that ever worked? Have you ever tried to cover up a mistake and not been found out? Yeah, it usually doesn't go well. But this is what we're going to have. This hero, this one that is on the top, we're going to find out just how broken this hero is in this story and in the, in the, with the people of Israel. So here we go. This is two whole chapters. So I hope you're ready. This is an extended edition to David. It's part, and you might know where I'm going, but we'll get there. So here we go. 2 Samuel 11 and 2 Samuel parts of 12, 1 through about 25. So here we go. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Amorites, besieged Rabbah, and David, David remained in Jerusalem. Now one evening, David got up from his bed, walked around to the roof of the palace, from the woof roof, he looked, and he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent somebody to find out about her. The man said, She's Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to go and get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself for her monthly uncleanliness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. And when Uriah came, David asked Joab, How are the soldiers? How's, the, how's Joab doing? How's the war going? But then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the place, and the gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants and did not go down to his house. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, Haven't you just come home from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. My commander Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house, eat, drink, and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. So then David said to him, Well, stay one more night. One more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. And at David's invitation, he ate and drank with him. David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, but he did not go home. So in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah, with Uriah. And it said, Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is the fiercest, then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab and the city were under siege, he put Uriah at the place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. But moreover, Uriah the Hittite fell. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king the account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up. And he might say, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know you would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, the son of Jerobesh? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, say to him, Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. So the messenger set out, and he arrived and told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger said to David, The men overpowered us, came against us in the open, and we drove them back at the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot down arrows on your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. 
Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as the other. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. And when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after a time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David did displeased the Lord. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. And when he came to him, he said, Let me tell you a story. There were two men of a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it, he grew up with it, and had it as his children. It shared his food, drank with his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, and the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who came to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. So David was burning with anger against this man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all of Israel and Judah. If all of this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity on you. Before your very eyes, I'll take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. He'll sleep with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all of Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. But because by doing this, you've shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child of Uriah's wife and born to David, and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted, spent nights lying in sackcloth on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he wouldn't eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child died, and David's attendants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while the child was still alive, he wouldn't listen to us when he spoke to him. How can we now tell him his child's dead? He may be more desperate. David noticed his attendants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead? he asked. Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground, and after he washed, put on lotions, and changed his clothes, he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request they served him food and they ate. His attendants asked, Why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, and now the child's dead, and you get up and eat? And he said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, and I thought, who knows? The God, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he's dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I'll go to him, but he will not return to me. Then David comforted his wife Bathsheba, and he went to her and made love to her. And she gave birth to a son, and they named him Solomon. The Lord loved him. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan the prophet to name him Jedidiah. That's a lot, isn't it? That's a, that's a lot to digest. There, there's a reason this text doesn't come up very often. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, and we don't necessarily want to go down those paths of these texts. But what it says it do, it reminds us, even the top, even our heroes, even those that are considered great, they are dead to sin. 
They are dead to sin. We too are dead to sin. You could hear the moment in the, in the passage where David died. As soon as, as Nathan said, you are that man. You're the guilty one. Dead. Hopeless. What is going to happen? What next? I know I messed up. He loses his son. He pleads. But his son still dies. And yet David is forgiven. And he still worships the Lord. That's an odd thing to think about, but that's what happened. We too, we're not perfect. Our heroes aren't perfect. Our legends, our underdogs, they're not perfect. They all make mistakes. And we try to cover it up too, but it doesn't work. This story is so relatable on many levels because of how human this story actually is. It reminds us that we will die to sin. We'll flatline to sin. It's all there. And David, David the child who died, us, Christ saves. Christ comes in. That even though we were dead to sin, we are made alive together with Christ. And in Christ alone. We confess, we repent, we turn towards the only one who can save us, which is Jesus. I want you to open, crack open your hymnals for a moment and go to Psalm number 51. And, the, and that's also the big number 51, so oddly it starts at 1. It's, so it's like hymn 51, but it'll be Psalm 51. So just look for the first 51. And I want us to read together aloud Psalm 51, verses 1 through... I say 1 through 12. And we're going to have this time as, as a time to confess. To confess that we have made mistakes and that we are indeed dead to sin. So if we're all there, let's read together in unison Psalm 51 and we'll stop after verse 12. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight. So you're justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be made clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin. Blot out all of my wickedness. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And sustain me with your bountiful spirit. And it is Reformation Week, and one of the texts that comes up every year is from Romans 3, and I want you to hear this as a part of an absolution. To know that, yes, we've made mistakes, yes, we sin, yes, we are dead to sin, but made alive again in Christ. And this is what I would like you to hear. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, they are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to demonstrate at the present time his own righteousness so that he is righteous and he had justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. And in the name of Jesus... Your sins are indeed forgiven. That's wonderful news. That's what we just got done singing a couple of minutes ago. That our God saves. And there is hope in Christ's name. Morning turns to praise for our God saves. No matter who we are, no matter how high, no matter how low, we will, we do die to sin. But we are made alive together in Christ, the one who saves. And that's what we come here to praise and worship each and every day. Thank you, God. Amen.
Let us pray. Gracious God, you are a forgiving God, and we are a broken, sinful people who live in a broken, sinful world. We give you thanks for your rescue mission, a a mission of healing, a mission of restoration and reconciliation. Bless us in the work of reconciliation and being reunited with those that from whom we are estranged, that we might find delight in each other and renewal in a relationship. And above all, um, help us to find reconciliation in our relationship with you, that we might walk with you all the days of our lives, even as you walk with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, that your church would be uh, a place of healing and forgiveness that your place would be a beacon of light that draws those who walk in darkness. Turn us again this day to you, O Lord, that we might lift up our voices in your praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick and suffering. We think today of those on our prayer list, Ruby Sue, Gisley, Liam, Hayden, Pastor Michelle, Jill, Linda, Lisa, Ashley, Jenny, Missionary Karen, and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in the Magianus, and all those whom we name before you in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for music, for song, uh, that we can lift up our voices to you in praise. For you, Lord, are worthy of our praise. As we... uh, enter this week of Reformation uh, celebration, we just continue to ask you, Lord, to bless your church with renewal day by day, and bless your people with that same renewal. And week by week, gather us in joyful celebration of your goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we prepare our hearts for Holy Communion, we hear the words that Jesus spoke on that night before his death as he came together with his disciples. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again after supper, Jesus took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come, the table is set. All are welcome. Tonight we will commune by um, pouring chalice. So you'll come forward, receive the wafer, go ahead and eat that, and then take an empty uh, cup, and we'll pour uh, wine or grape juice into into that, whichever you prefer. We also have um, the pre-packaged Uh, kits available. If you would like one of those, let us know and we'll make sure that you get one. And we have gluten-free in the packets too, right? Okay. We do have gluten-free wafers also. So why don't we serve this side first and then we'll move the empty cups over to this side. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his most precious blood strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let all God's people say, Amen. Our sending song tonight is Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Come on up, kids. It's one of your favorites, I think. Pharaoh, Pharaoh.
you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine on you with grace and mercy, and the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. God is good? All the time. All the time. Yeah, sure you betcha. Have a good week, everyone.